At the beginning of the year, I felt like God gave me a word for the church that 2024 was going to be a year of equipping, a year of equipping. Um, naturally, as a church and as a pastor, we understand that our role is to equip the church, but, but I felt it on a, um, on a deeper level that in this year, we needed to be equipped. And that's why when we started off the year in January, we started with a prayer focus, 21 days of prayer. And we're talking about the importance of prayer. We, we preached a sermon series called Ask, Seek, Knock. Anybody remember that series? Even if you didn't, just clap and say amen so I can at least feel good in my heart. <clears throat> February, we focused on family. Did a series about family being messy. Now we're in March. I'm gonna spend the next two weeks teaching on evangelism, evangelism. And I want to prepare because I want to prepare you for what God is about to do in his church in the next couple of weeks. It's gonna be a great harvest in the church. It's gonna be, watch this, it's gonna be lost people walking through the doors of the church again. It's gonna be hurting people, watch this. There's gonna be people who've been hurt in church that are gonna give God another try at Easter. They're gonna walk in. I'm, I'm talking about people who said, I'll never go back. I'll never go back. And by the grace of God, they're gonna come back because the Spirit of God, the Bible says no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit and the Holy Spirit is working and moving in the hearts and lives of people. And so the Holy Spirit is drawing people to Him but we need to be prepared. We need to be ready when they get here. And we also, watch this, one of the ways that God's going to fill his house is because the people of God who fill it are gonna go tell other people about God, amen? And so we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that today. I wanna get you ready for Easter. I'm gonna read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I will tell you, 2 Corinthians 5, one of my favorite passages of scripture. <laughs> um, when I was a teenager, this verse, verse 17, is the verse that caught my attention. I must confess to you that even though I appreciate it, I did, I did not understand it until maybe 10, 15 years later. But here's what the Bible says, it still blessed me even though I didn't understand it. <laughs> then when I got the understanding, it set me free. Consequently, on Easter, we're going to start a series called Forever Free. And there's some things that God is going to set you free from that when he does, you won't be free for a day or a week or a month. But Jesus said, you're going to know the truth and the truth is going to set you free. When the truth of God's word is deposited into the fertile soil of your heart, it produces life. And there's some things God is going to set us free from. Somebody just say amen by faith. Amen. Amen. So the Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And the old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. I remember being a teenager, hearing that verse for the first time. Isn't that amazing? Even as a teenager, already lived enough life to know there were some things that I wanted gone out of my life. If anyone be in Christ, he is a what? A new, not just a better version of who you were, not just a cleaned up version of who you were, you're not even the same person. You are a brand new creation. And the Bible says that the old things are gone. Thank you, Jesus. And all things have become new. And verse 18 says, and now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus. Watch this. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Please hear this. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Incredible. 
and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. It blows my mind, but God's plan is you and I. The plan to reach the world is us. Now, I, I, I feel just a twinge of anxiety when I think about that. God's, God's plan, and I got news for you, there's no other plan. It's us or nothing. God's plan to reach the world is committing to us the word of reconciliation. And now then, Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. The, the things that jump out of me, Scripture says that God has reconciled us to himself. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Who has the ministry of reconciliation? Those that have been reconciled. Quick question. If you've been reconciled to God through his son Jesus, would you raise your hand for a second? Would you raise your hand every campus, every location? Now, with that same hand raised, recognize that you have been given the ministry of reconciliation because there is this thought process and I don't know I don't know how it crept into the church I don't know how it got in but it got in and when it got in it bit and it stuck and there is this idea that the ministry is for the pastors and the people come and watch that the ministry is for people who are called the full-time pastoral ministry we say I'm called to ministry which means this is what I do this is my vocation and then there is this idea that those who come to church we just simply listen and agree and watch other people do ministry and I gotta tell you we rebuke that idea in the strong name of Jesus it's not biblical it's not godly it's not the will of God, I got five people clapping, but that's okay. Um, maybe you're just thinking, and, I, and I'll give that to you, just process. The ministry of reconciliation has been given to the people who have been reconciled to God. And the church said, amen. amen. So we, we have, somebody say we. We have the ministry of reconciliation. In Ephesians 4.12 the Bible says that God gives pastors to the church for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So the whole reason why we have pastors and teachers is so that the church can be equipped not to watch but to work. Not, not, not just to listen but to do. And something happens. You wanna know the churches that are making an impact? It's the churches where the people understand I'm called to ministry. God has given me a ministry and my ministry is to reach lost people. My, my ministry is to, is to reach broken people. My ministry is to reach people that are far from God. Watch this. You say, well, who are they? They're the people who you look at every single Monday. They're the people that you grab coffee with and meet at the coffee station. They're the people that you live next to and work next to and God is calling us to reach these people. I want to preach a message today entitled Just One More. Just One More. Say it with me. Just One More. Father God, today would you add your blessing to the reading of your word? Would you help your word to become alive in our heart? And would you help us to receive today and be spurred to action? Action. The blessing is connected to the one that hears and does. The book of James, it says, the one who hears but doesn't do, like a man looking at himself in a mirror walks away and instantly forgets who he was and the image. You said that that person is a double-minded person, unstable in all their ways. And then you said, let not that person expect that they will receive anything from God. And so we recognize it's not enough to hear. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But once we hear 
Our faith puts what we heard into practice. Our faith takes what we heard and puts it into action. So I'm praying today, God, that as we receive today, I, I just eyes open and ears open in the next 20, 30 minutes, God, just to receive your word. We recognize right now, Father, you want to talk to us. You want to speak to us. I know some people have been praying all week long, God, give me a word. God says, I'm going to give it to you right now. Listen. Tune in. Put down every distraction. Turn your phone off. Put down every hindrance, anything that would pull you away from hearing the word of God right now. And, and, and tune in to what the Spirit would say to you today in this service. Help us, God, to have a mindset that says just one more. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. In 2016, a movie came out called Hacksaw Ridge. Anybody see it? Great, great, great movie. The movie is about a man by the name of Desmond Doss, who was a World War II American Army medic who served during the Battle of Okinawa, Desmond was a Christian. Desmond loved the Lord, and he had a personal conviction about killing. And he wanted to serve his country, but he didn't want to take a life. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole other conversation that I'm totally prepared to have. I just can't have it right now. Uh, fighting the urge to say that. Okay, I'll just leave it alone. Um, when Desmond Doss was a kid, his mother had a picture of the Ten Commandments in the family room. And Desmond Doss would go up and he would pull a chair up next to the picture frame and he would stand up and he would read the, the Ten Commandments that his mother had photographed in, in a portrait. And he would think about the story of Cain and Abel and history tells us that he would ask his mother, why would a brother kill his brother? And there was something formative that happened in the heart of Desmond Doss as he was a child that shaped the rest of his life, shaped the rest of his life. He became a medic in the military, but watch this. He refused to carry a weapon. Now, I'm just telling you, if you're going to be in the military... <clears throat> You're going to need a weapon, and yet Desmond refused to carry one, refused. He felt like he could still serve his country, but that he could serve his country by saving lives. Here's what he said. He said, I can't picture Christ out there killing people, but I can picture him out there saving people. And so, as you can imagine, Desmond's view was not popular with the other soldiers, the other soldiers didn't appreciate his ideology, and Desmond Doss was harassed severely by the other soldiers. They say that when he would kneel down next to his bunk at night and he would pray, that the soldiers would throw their boots at him while he was kneeling down to pray. Some soldiers would grab weapons and force them into his hand, and Desmond would not hold the weapon. He just would not do it. But these same soldiers, as they went to war, watch this, their attitude changed about Desmond Doss. Doss would enter the battlefield with no weapon. He would enter onto the battlefield with just his medical equipment. And while the soldiers went to war, Desmond went to work. Desmond was determined to save as many soldiers as he could. And fighting in the jungle, the Japanese soldiers started to target medics. They would actually fire onto medics to, 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 to kill the morale of the soldiers. They would look for the Red Cross emblem and they would fire and shoot medics to kill medics just to demoralize the, the American soldiers. And most medics would pull the Red Cross off their sleeves and not wear it because they were targeted. Desmond Doss refused to pull the Red Cross 
off his sleeve and continue. Sometimes at night, here's what history tells us, after long battles, there were certain soldiers that would go back onto the battlefield and Doss would go with them on night missions, dragging back the wounded that were left on the battlefield during the day. Now let me just say real quick, he wasn't even supposed to do that. That wasn't even a part of his job responsibilities, but he did it anyways. And as they would carry soldiers, wounded soldiers, off the battlefield back to camps, there would be bullets that were flying over the top of their head. They could hear them as the enemy soldiers were firing on them. Doss, I'm told that, you know, as an army medic, the first thing you do is triage, and you determine who has the greatest chance of survival. You're not just grabbing anybody. If there's two people there, then you quickly assess who has the greatest chance of survival, and you would grab that person, not Desmond. Desmond brought back everybody. Desmond brought back the wounded. He brought back the mortally wounded. He brought back everybody. And when he would take them back to the place called Hacksaw Ridge, he would take them back to a place of Hacksaw Ridge, a very, very steep cliff. When Desmond was a kid, he learned how to tie a bow knot. I don't even know what a bow knot is, but it sounds good. He would tie a bow knot, and he figured out a way how to slip the wounded soldier's arms through the bow knot and cinch them up, and then he would lower the wounded men off the side of Hacksaw Ridge all the way down to soldiers that were on the bottom who would collect the wounded. And the whole time he is doing this, lowering them down, there are bullets flying over the top. This is documented history from multiple sources. I mean, you gotta be careful nowadays because Hollywood can make a good movie. Talk to me, somebody. Hollywood can make a good movie, but what we're talking about right now is history. What we're talking about right now is verifiable by multiple sources and people that were there, including men who were recovered from the battlefield and lowered down on the bowline knot that Doss would make. And what was interesting, I thought this was interesting, is that there was uh, Japanese soldiers who later testified that they even had Desmond Doss in their sights as he was lowering people to drop them down. One, one Japanese soldier testified. He said, I tried to shoot him, but when I tried to shoot him, my gun jammed. What a coincidence! The world would say, wow, what a, what, a, what a coincidence there. So Desmond Doss, watch this. He's lowering soldiers down over and over and over again. And he kept going back over and over again to, to save more wounded soldiers. Watch this. And this was the prayer of his heart. Are you ready? Listen to this. This was the prayer of the heart. Lord, please help me to get one more. This was the prayer of Desmond Doss. God, please, he would grab a wounded soldier, tie them in a slipknot, hand them down, bullets flying, and then instead of going down himself, he would say to God, God, help me to get just one more. He spent 12 hours rescuing wounded soldiers, and on that day alone, at the end of the day, 75 wounded men owed their lives to Desmond Doss. Yeah, praise God. I pray to God. Have you ever heard somebody say they don't make them like they used to? I'm praying to God that's not true. And there's still some people, perhaps even sitting here in Oakland or Mineola, who, who God is working through even right now. Watch this. One particular battle, I thought this was interesting. One particular battle, the captain came to Desmond Doss and said, Desmond, the men would really appreciate it if you would go with them on, on this last push, this final push, this battle. And Desmond, watch this. He, the captain said, I know you don't have to go, but boy, the men would surely appreciate Desmond the one the soldiers reviled, they now revered. So much so that they wouldn't even go to battle 
unless Desmond went with him. And the captain said, I know you don't have to go, Desmond, but the men would really appreciate it if you would. And Desmond said, I'll go. I'll go with blood on his uniform of the soldiers he had already rescued. He said, I'll go. He said, but I'm reading this passage of scripture. You'll have to wait till I get done reading. So a captain walks back to his men and said, Desmond said he's going to go. And the men erupted in cheers and excitement. And then they're like, let's go. And he said, no, 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 you got to wait till he's done reading. An entire group of men were held up by one man who was reading. An entire army held up by one man who was reading scripture. And when he got done reading and talking to God and prayed, he stood up. They went into battle. And it was the final push of Hacksaw Ridge. Desmond Doss, he was the first American soldier to receive the Medal of Honor. Watch this. Without ever firing a single shot. Now, tell me, why would a medic enter a battlefield without a weapon, saving other people's lives, people he does not know and people he perhaps has never met, why would he do that with a mindset that says just one more person? Can I submit to you my own thought about this? Desmond knew Jesus. Desmond was a man of God. Desmond loved the Lord, and Desmond wanted to reach lost people. And I just want to say real quick that this should be the attitude of the church. This should be the attitude of the people who show up on every Sunday to worship God. We ought to have an attitude in us that says just one more. When is the church going to be, I'm telling you, just one more? We ought to have an attitude in the church, no matter how many people you have personally walked to faith, no matter how many people you have personally invited to come into church. I'm, I'm telling you, the saddest thing for some of us is that some of our greatest stories are 20 years ago. We need stories today of ways that God is using us and bringing just one more into the house of God. See, at Lakeside, you need to understand this, we've got a mission, we've got a mission. We are not here just to sit in a service and be entertained for 75 minutes. We, we are not here just simply to show up and to run through all the motions of what the Americas call church and then leave the same way we walked in. We have a mission. What is the mission? We want to make disciples. We want to make new ones. We want to make better ones. And everything, yeah, put a clap on it if you believe it. Everything we do is centered on our mission. I said this a long time ago. The church is not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. But that's tough because in our Americanized culture, we treat church like a cruise ship and people walk in and say, where are the umbrella drinks? Who is setting out my towel next to my chair out in the sun so I can enjoy this? And we treat church like a cruise ship. But if you are looking for the umbrella drinks and you are looking for the Lido deck, I just tell you right now, you at the wrong church. You have to go out and find another one. This is a battleship. Everybody in this church has an assignment. We have a mission. We have a purpose. And the whole reason why we exist is to know Christ and to make Christ No. Amen, anybody. And one of the cultural commitments of our church, you need to understand the culture. Every church has a culture. And the culture of our church is characterized by this one statement right here. There is always room for one more. Say it with me. There is always room for one more more. It was spring break this week. Spring break was this week. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out where everybody's at. Okay, so now I know the spring break. I know, you, hey, everybody gets a vacation. It's cool. See you next week. There is always room for one more. I'm just telling you, here's the, that's the attitude of this church. 
We're never full. We're never full. There, there are some Sundays where there is not an empty seat in this, but watch this. Even when every seat is filled, we're still not full. Because there's always room for one more, right? Uh, anytime, anytime. We're gonna go into Easter, and I promise you, there are gonna be in services, they're gonna be completely full. But watch this. The attitude of every single person, our staff and our dream team, here's what you'll hear them say. There's always room for one more. There's always enough space for what we, we, can, we can bring in seats and make sure that every single person already, we have pushed seats forward. We have brought in seats here in Oakland. We have accommodated trying to make space for people. Why? Because there is always room for one more. If we have to open up overflow, we will open up overflow. We've had Sundays where overflow had overflow, but we didn't turn anybody away. We didn't say to anybody, we're full. I'm sorry. I'll tell you, here's language you will never hear at the Lakeside Church. We're full. If you hear somebody say it, rebuke them. If you hear somebody say, we're full, you say to them, not at Lakeside, because there is always room for one more. If we got 15 chairs, somebody is about to go find chair number 16. If there's 40, 50 chairs in the room, we're going to find 10 more because we are never full. There is always room for one more. And the whole church said, amen. I remember when the church ran just 200 people. And the challenge of a small church is everybody thinks you work for them. And they tell you things like that. They tell you, how do you, I don't know that. They used to tell me things like that. Don't forget who pays your check. I found out a long time ago, you don't pay my check. Jesus pays my check. I found out. See, you had me in the beginning because I didn't know. You said it. I thought about it. And I said, yeah, you're right. Let me please you. And then I just found out you don't ever cut my checks. The Holy Spirit cuts my checks. Praise God. And if you left today, God has send somebody else tomorrow to bring into what I need. The pastor cannot bend his communication based on people that are trying to manipulate the pastor with their giving. I only want to talk to people who understand that what you give is an offering not to the pastor, but is an offering to the Lord through the church to make sure that the church is on mission. So when the church ran like 200 people, they would say things to me like this. Well, I don't know, pastor. I feel like the church is getting too big. I can see their face right now as I, as I think about it. I can, Jesus, help me love those people. <laughs> well, the church is getting too big, Pat. 200 people. The church is getting too big. I'm thinking to myself, who would you prefer go to hell? so that we can keep the church at a comfortable level for you. And then the, we want to maximize your comfort at the church. So, so help me as a pastor. Who do we turn away and tell them to go to hell because you want your comfortable little church of 200 people, consequently, that even at 200, you don't know everybody's name even right now. I don't want the church to get too big. Once it gets too big, I'm not gonna know everybody. If the church ran 100, guess what? You wouldn't know everybody. Even when the church was 200, I, I remember thinking, since that moment, thousands and thousands, we've created God through the church. There's been thousands and thousands of vacancies in hell, and heaven's been populated. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, like, if we were to go back and have a conversation, I just want to ask them, of the thousands and thousands of people who have received Christ, which one would you prefer? We didn't reach so that you could keep the church at a size and a level that is comfortable for you. You understand what I'm talking about? See, see, the heart of God is to go after the one. And if the heart of God is to go after the one, then the heart of this house is to go after one. Whenever I read scripture, I read things about the good shepherd who says that things like this, that he will leave the 99. That it, Jesus can have 99 people in the house, but if there is just how many? 
if there's just one person, Jesus says, I will leave the 99. I will go find the one person. I will find the one person and bring them back. And if the heart of God is to leave 99 found people to find one lost person, then the heart of this house. It's going to be to leave 99 people who are already found to find one person. There's one time when Jesus was teaching and preaching, and the house was full, and they started taking apart the roof. Can you imagine in service today, while I'm talking, somebody is drilling, cutting. I don't even know what you got to do to get through this roof right here, but can you imagine... And Jesus is talking, and he doesn't say, hey, I'm talking in here. Hey, I'm teaching. I'm, I'm trying to communicate something. What does he do? He'll stop the whole thing. Say, wait a second. There's room for. G Jesus will say, no, 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 no. There's room for one more person in here. Yeah, but we got to open up the roof to get him in. Jesus said, I know, and there's still room for one more. So if this is the heart of Jesus, guess what? This is the heart of the house. And the whole church here at Lakeside said, amen. now I need a better amen than that. The whole church said, amen. just one more, just one more. I'll never forget, I, I don't have time to share this, but I'll share it anyways. <laughs> I'll never forget, Pastor Sheila, you called me with a situation with a group where a person was leading a group here at Lakeside, and evidently it didn't have enough people in it for the person to teach this group. It only had three people. Now, I understand, like, a perfect group is about 15, you know, I don't know, 30. Doesn't matter to us. Whatever. I'm just talking about enough for people to talk back and have real conversations or whatever. The larger your group gets, it's a little more challenging to have conversations. So we do have large groups break into small groups, and so there's a good strategy. It works. Um, but I remember getting that phone call from Pastor Sheila, and there was somebody who was teaching. One of our dream team leaders was complaining because there was only three people in the group, and, and she told me about it. And I got to tell you, I remember exactly where I was when I got the phone call. I was, I was at Publix on 455 and Highway 50. <laughs> Caroline was inside. She was getting something. I don't remember what she was getting but I do remember that as I was having the conversation with this group leader, Caroline got in the car. And I do remember her face during my communication <laughs> because I tell you right now, I was letting this dude have it. Because at Lakeside, we'll do it for the one. <laughs> at, at Lakeside, watch this. If we have a group and there is one person in it, can I tell you, one person has enough value from God to warrant my communication for the next 90 minutes. I'm just telling you what the attitude of the house is. One person, one soul, one individual has enough value to command your attention for an entire day. And I can just tell you right now, I. They're not here no more. But when we were on that phone call, I can tell you when we got done, we had clarity. We had clarity. Here's what the Bible says. If anyone is in Christ, he is a... And old things have passed away and all things have become new. Please notice the Bible says, therefore, if anyone, anyone, who am I going to reach? Here it is. Anyone. Who, who do I take this message of reconciliation to? In, anyone. If anyone be in Christ, he's a, I know sometimes we like to pick and choose who we bring the message to based on our estimation of who they are or whatever. But I'm just telling you, the Bible says anyone, anyone, any person. It, no matter what their past is, no matter what they've done, good, bad, right, wrong, whatever, it doesn't matter what their race is, their nationality, their ethnic, ethnicity, their economic status, it doesn't matter what language they speak, it doesn't matter where they grew up, it doesn't matter how much money they have or don't have, it doesn't matter. The Bible says if anyone, somebody shout anyone, calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. 
So at Lakeside, we're trying to reach anyone. And the moment anyone comes to Christ in true repentance and humility, they receive Christ. In that moment, the Bible says they become a new creation, a new creation. It's what we call regeneration. It's a change that takes place. Not only are you forgiven, but you are changed. How many remember when you got saved? Let me just say real quick, if you got saved, you didn't change, you didn't get saved. You prayed a prayer. You ran through the motions. I, I'm, I, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about you start doing everything better overnight. God knows, took me a, still taking me some time. Talk to me somebody. Still, God's still working. But one of the ways you know you have truly come to faith is there is a change. There is a transformation in your heart and in your mindset where you want to serve God. You want to live right. You want to live holy and pure, righteous before God. You, you want to know his word and do it and live it. There is this transformation, right? There is this regeneration that happens. You are new creation. Watch this. None of us are perfect, but you ought to be different. Now, we'll talk about that next week, but you ought to be different. There ought to be people at work saying, you know, so-and-so's just a little. There ought to be people at your work talking about you being a little different. If you're not different, something's wrong. You ought to be different. You ought to be different. Why? There's a transformation taking place. We're in the process of being transformed, becoming more and more like Jesus. We are a new creation. We're learning how to be this new creation in our mind and our soul. And now the Bible says in verse 18, and now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not holding our sins against us, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And I just want to show you, I'm going to wrap this thing up super, super fast. So everybody grab what you need to grab so we can get out of here. <clears throat> Watch this. Who initiates reconciliation? You or God? God initiates reconciliation. You, you did not come to God. God came to you. You, you didn't find God. God found you. God left heaven, came to earth to find you. And God initial, uh, initiated reconciliation. Now, watch this. Uh, we can end marital disagreements in two seconds if somebody would initiate reconciliation. How is it that people are married and arguing for 30 days? I'll tell you why. Because in your pride, nobody will be the bigger person to step up and to initiate how can two people go to the same church and refuse to talk to each other? I'll tell you how. Pride. Because somebody's refusing to be the man of God or the woman of God and do what God does and be the one that initiates, reconciliate. What I love about God, God did not wait for us. He came to us. He initiates reconciliation. And we respond to the incredible grace of God. We place our faith in him. We become new creations, the Bible says, and then God gives us the ministry of reconciliation. He commits to us the word of reconciliation. And that's why in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Stand with me, stand with me. We implore you, but as you stand, listen, listen, listen. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Watch this. Be reconciled to God. God. Let's go with me here. We've been reconciled to God through his son, Jesus Christ. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. God has given us the word of reconciliation. And now the Bible says we are God's ambassadors. We are God's ambassadors. We are God's representative. Whenever you look at that word ambassador, an ambassador is a representative of a higher authority that is sent to represent their interests and deliver their messages. We have United States ambassadors all over the world. 
they're on foreign soil, but they represent the United States. They, they are not at liberty to communicate whatever they feel like communicating. They only communicate the message from the President of the United States. In that same way, God says, we are his ambassadors. Watch this. This earth is not our home. Heaven is our home. Which means that even now on this earth, we are on foreign soil. But we represent Jesus Christ. We are God's ambassadors. And so watch this. It means we don't speak what we want to speak and we don't say what we want to say. We only communicate what the king has communicated to us. We only say, what you going to preach this week? Whatever's right here in the word of God. What are you going to preach next week? Whatever's here right here in the word of God. What are you going to preach 50 years from now? What is right here in the word of God? Because as a pastor, if he's a real pastor, if he's worth his salt as a pastor, he's not preaching his opinions and he's not preaching what society accepts. He is preaching the unadulterated, inerrant, infallible word of God cover to cover. We are on foreign soil as ambassadors of God. And what is the message that we preach? Be reconciled. Be reconciled. We have one message. Here it is. Be reconciled to God.